We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark, and we're concluding our studies in the Gospel of Mark. Our text this morning is Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. Uh, these are uh, disputed verses, as we will uh, see in our lesson, but uh, I'm going to begin with verse 8 to remind us of uh, where some believe, and I'm among them, that uh, th this is where Mark intended to conclude his uh, gospel. The Lord has been resurrected. The women went to the tomb to complete the burial with spices that they had prepared and the tomb was empty, and an angel was there announcing that he had risen. And the response of the women, having been told to go and tell the others of his resurrection, is given in verse 8. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. That seems to be an abrupt an uh, unusual ending for the gospel. And so we read in verse 9, Now after he had risen early on the first day of the week, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. When they heard that he was alive, and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. After that, he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along on their way to the country. They went away and reported it to the others, but they did not believe them either. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. And he approached them for their unbelief, reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. May the Lord bless this reading of the text and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. How did Mark end his gospel? That is a question that New Testament scholar Bruce Metzger asked in his book, The Text of the New Testament. He answered, unfortunately, we do not know. The earliest texts and documents like Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus do not have the last 12 verses, verses 9 through 20. The early church historian Eusebius, who lived in the early 300s, stated that the most accurate copies of the New Testament and almost all copies known to him omitted those verses. Also, the literary style of those verses gives little to no support to their being written by Mark. They contain a number of words and phrases, something like 17, that are not used in the Gospel of Mark, which suggests that they were penned by the hand of a different author. All of that strong evidence that verse 8 of chapter 16 is the last verse in the Gospel written by Mark's hand. 
But is that where Mark meant to end his gospel? That's what Professor Metzger asked. Did Mark intend to conclude his gospel with the melancholy statement that the women were afraid? Now that's a question that many readers have had. It is abrupt and it does seem melancholy. It uh, certainly doesn't appear to be hopeful like the other gospels. So what happened? Some speculate that Mark wrote the book in Rome and was interrupted by Nero's persecution and unable to finish it. Others suggest that Mark died before finishing it, perhaps died in that persecution. And others think it's likely that the last page of the original copy was simply lost. But whatever happened to Mark or to the final verses, they feel that it was not Mark's purpose to end his gospel on verse 8. So, what are we to make of these last 12 verses? Many dismiss them as spurious and superstitious. Others recognize them as genuine, inspired scripture, just written by another person. And some think they know who the author of those verses is. A 10th century Armenian manuscript discovered in 1891 supplies the name of the man said to have written it, the elder Ariston. Now, as I've indicated, I'm of the opinion that Mark intended to end his gospel with verse 8. And I don't think anything was lost. I don't think he was cut short in his intention in writing this. He intended to end with verse 8. And I'll speak about that further uh, as uh, we continue in our lesson. But I think it's fair to consider the longer ending of verses 9 through 20. This ending is familiar to many through the King James Version of the Bible, which is based on the Textus Receptus, a family of Greek manuscripts. There are a number of them in that, uh, that group in the Textus Receptus. I have a large number of manuscripts, but they are not the earliest manuscripts. Uh, Nevertheless, we will study these verses because of the longer endings connection with the King James Version. Uh, this, is past, uh, this, has, uh, this passage has a long history in the church. Many have uh, taught it and believe that this is part of the gospel. And I think for that reason, it's worthy of our consideration. There are uh, a few unusual statements in it. But for the most part, it is simply a summary of the other three gospel accounts added to the text to round off the ending and avoid what seems to be an incomplete conclusion. It contains a list of appearances of the Lord. They are brief and they follow the order of the other gospels. The first appearance is to Mary Magdalene, which is recorded in John's Gospel, John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. She is the first person to whom Christ appeared. It was um, historically the way things happened. That's why it's recorded here. But also, it was providentially arranged, his appearance to her. And it was done so that the Lord might honor her. She had honored him in his life and in his death. She was a loyal follower who served him and the disciples. She was there at the cross and then at the tomb while the others were hiding in fear. Bishop J.C. Ryle stated that the Lord's appearance first to Mary was intended to be a perpetual memorial to the church that those who do honor Christ, he will honor. And he added, those who do much for him on earth will find him even on earth doing much for them. And that's true. The Lord said in 1 Samuel 2, uh, 2 verse 30, those who honor me, I will honor. And he's faithful to do that. He did that for Mary Magdalene. 
In verses 10 and 11, she went to the disciples and reported that she had seen the resurrected Christ. They were mourning and weeping, we're told, but the joyful news that she brought them fell on deaf ears because they refused to believe it, which is the repeated response of the disciples to the good news that's given after the Lord's next appearance in verse 12 to the disciples walking along their way to the country, a reference to the two disciples on the Emmaus Road in Luke 24. Verse 13 states, They went away and reported it to the others, but they did not believe them either. So now they've heard the testimony of three of their small band and have not believed the news that confirmed the promise Jesus gave to them before his death that he would rise on the third day. They're not believing the witnesses because they're not believing Christ. Regardless of the authorship of these verses, that is true. They were men who had every reason to believe and be encouraged, but they didn't believe. They didn't believe the Word of God. They were weak and fearful. That's true to life, isn't it? That's true to human nature. The Lord's servants failed him, but the Lord would not fail his servants. And while they were hiding behind closed doors, hiding behind locked doors, Jesus appeared in the room and said, Peace be to you. And this is found in both Luke and John's Gospels. At uh, a moment when to their eyes all was dark and their world was shattered, the Lord appears to them bodily, materially, and declares victory, peace. That was the reality. Not what they thought, but what He said. And so it is for us. We may be discouraged and feel that all things are against us and that they may be hard things. They may be very discouraging. In fact, we're all going to go through difficulties in this life. Some more than others, no doubt. But that's just life in a fallen world, whether you're a believer or not. And especially the believer, though, is tested and goes through difficulties. And that's why we need the Word of God so desperately to prepare us for that, to equip us for that. We go through difficulties that are discouraging. But this is the reality. Peace. Because the Savior lives and He has us in His hand. That's the message He gives to them. And in verses 15 through 18, the Lord gives them another message. He gives them the Great Commission. We read in verse 15. And He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Now that was given in Galilee. So we're probably to assume the writer made a shift in scenes from Jerusalem to there. What is included here? And in Matthew as well, Matthew 28, is the scope of the mission. All the world. That's true. It's accurate, regardless of the origin of these verses. And it makes a significant change from the Lord's earlier ministry. When, if you remember back in chapter 7, he was outside the land and he's confronted by the Syrophoenician woman. Syrophoenician woman was a Gentile. She was a Canaanite. And he explained that his ministry was not for her, it was for the children of Israel. He first came to the Jew, not the Gentile. But with his rejection by his own people, with his death and resurrection, the scope of the gospel, the scope of the ministry of our Lord and the church has expanded to all the nations. That was the ultimate purpose of God, stated in the covenant that God made with Abraham. 
Way back in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, that he would make him, make Abraham, a blessing to all the families of the earth. That blessing would be fulfilled ultimately in Abraham's descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ, who through his sacrifice would purchase some from or out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, worldwide in its scope. Having done that on the cross, the Lord sent his people out across the globe to proclaim to all creation the good news of forgiveness and salvation in Christ. That occurred in the first century. It has occurred in the centuries that follow. It occurs today as men from here go to Cuba and proclaim the gospel. Go to Europe. Go to Central Asia and proclaim the gospel. And God does wonders through the preaching of his word across this globe. That's the mission. The long ending of the chapter concludes in verses 19 and 20 with the Lord's ascension into heaven and his enthronement at the Father's right hand. This is what literally happened. Luke describes it in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. In Acts 7, verse 55, the Lord is seen at the Father's right hand standing when Stephen was martyred. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 also states that when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So all of this in Mark 16 is accurate and simply a summary of passages from the other Gospels and New Testament passages, assuming it was written by someone other than Mark. The only troublesome verses in this passage are verse 16, that suggests baptism is necessary for salvation. It doesn't say that, but it seems to suggest that. And then in verse 18, with the statements about handling snakes and drinking poison. Uh, Now, one way to deal with these difficulties is uh, simply to dismiss them as additions to the gospel, as not original to Mark, and, and so irrelevant since they're not Scripture. But I don't think that's a necessary way to deal with them. They they can each be explained in a reasonable and orthodox way. Uh, That's what I'll attempt to do. First, in verse 16, there is an emphasis on baptism. Now, this is part of the Great Commission. When the gospel had been preached, the verse states, He who has believed and been baptized shall be saved, and he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. The close connection here between baptism and and faith seems, as I said, to suggest that baptism is essential. It's necessary for salvation, that baptism plus faith is the gospel. But the stress here is on belief. It's not on baptism. And that's further indicated by the fact that the word baptize is omitted in the second half of the verse where the unbeliever is condemned. His condemnation is due to disbelief, not to a failure to be baptized. So salvation rests on belief and that alone. Baptism is necessary for the believer. It is included, as I stated, as you know, in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verse 19, the missionaries were to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So every believer in Jesus Christ is to be baptized. It's not an option. But the necessity is not for salvation, it is for discipleship. It is the way we identify with Christ and publicly confess our faith. We we talked about secret disciples. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were that for a time. They were afraid to confess their faith in Christ. And then at the end, they came out. They 
were there at the, at the cross. They took the body. They identified with Christ in his burial. One must come forward in one's uh, confession of faith in Christ. And that's what baptism does. It is a public profession of faith, a public statement of one joining himself or herself to Christ in his crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. Now that's clear from the rest of Scripture. Every, every verse, and this is a rule of interpretation, every verse must be studied in the larger context of Scripture as a whole. We don't take a text, a verse, and isolate it and build a whole series of doctrines on that one verse without seeing it in light of all of Scripture. And so that's necessary to do to get the whole context of Scripture in order to understand a verse. And that's true of this. The New Testament does not teach that baptism adds anything to salvation. We are saved through faith alone, not by ceremonies. Whether those ceremonies are circumcision or baptism or the Lord's Supper. Now that's the teaching of the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians. It was written in response to that very error that very heresy to refute Judaizers who were advocating circumcision for salvation, who were saying it's important that you believe, it's necessary that you believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior. But all we know from the Judaizers, they believed in an orthodox view of Jesus Christ, who he was and what he'd done on the cross. But they said, faith is not enough. You must add to that circumcision. Believe and be circumcised in order to be saved. And Paul denounced that, rejected that. He said, you are seeking to be justified by law. If you add one aspect of the law to the gospel, you're trying to be justified by the law. He said, you have fallen from grace. That doesn't mean you've fallen, you've lost your salvation. It means you've fallen away from the principle of grace. You are now embracing something that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, at the very beginning of that book, Paul calls such an idea a different gospel, not the true gospel. And he pronounced anathema on those who preach it, even if it's an angel that preaches it. He is to be accursed, he said. Adding a work to God's work, even one work, just one thing done one time, and even an approved work, a good work like circumcision for the Jew or baptism corrupts the gospel, destroys it. It's no gospel at all. Well, Paul makes that same point positively in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, which is a classic statement about the gospel. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, is, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Did you read baptism in either one of those verses? This is a statement of the gospel and the power of the gospel. No mention of baptism. All the emphasis is on faith. That is the, the idea in the statement from faith to faith. That's a, a, a difficult phrase and has different explanations. But the way that I believed it's to be understood, it's a way of being redundant to make the point that it is through faith alone that you're saved. From faith to faith, from start to finish, salvation is by faith alone, all together. Salvation is received, it's not achieved. It's a free gift. It is by grace alone, through faith alone. Salvation is of the Lord, it's not of us, it's not of anything we do. Even the faith that lays hold of Christ is a gift of God. Now that doesn't minimize, again, the importance of baptism. It is, as I said, a profession of faith. 
It's what the believer does in obedience to Christ and as a way of publicly identifying with him. It doesn't save, but does sanctify. It's used of God in that way, and every believer is to do it. Again, it's not an option. Now, what about these five signs that will accompany believers in their preaching of the gospel? Uh, some of them seem rather strange. They will have power over demons. They will speak in tongues, handle snakes without danger, drink poison without harm, and be able to heal the sick by laying on of hands. This last sign is the instruction that James gives the sick in James 5, verses 14 and 15. They are to call for the elders of the church who will anoint them with oil and pray for healing. Uh, they're to confess sin if there's sin in their life, and they'll lay their hands upon them and, and pray for them, pray for healing. We, we do that here. But the other signs are, I have to say, outside my personal experience. Nevertheless, they're not altogether outside the experience of the apostles and the first century church. The, the Gospels and the book of Acts record the Lord and the disciples, um, a large circle of disciples, but also the apostles casting out demons. Uh, that might be unusual for us, but it was not unusual for the Lord and for the apostles. And we don't know the, the way things are going in our evil age as we approach the last days. Perhaps it will not be all that unusual in our days. The controversy is really around picking up serpents and drinking poison. There's little to nothing in the New Testament to support either one of these signs. There is one incident in the book of Acts involving Paul and a snake when he was on the island of Malta. It's in Acts 28, verse 5. Paul gathered sticks for a fire, and among the, the sticks was a sleeping viper, which awoke from the warmth and bit his hand. And Paul shook it off into the fire and suffered no harm. The miracle was used of God in the conversion of many natives on the island. But Paul didn't deliberately pick up a snake in order to demonstrate his great faith. As for drinking poison, there's uh, no way to explain that from the New Testament. There is at least no example of such a thing. Eusebius in the 4th century quoted Papias, who was a friend of the Apostle John. So it goes way back to the 1st and early 2nd century. Uh, as referring to a man named Justice, drinking poison and not suffering from it. But nothing is found in the New Testament like that. We normally associate snake handling and poison drinking with uh, strange cults in the backwoods of Appalachia whose uh, conduct is superstitious and often fatal. In fact, they call these uh, the five Bible signs. And they practice them, especially handling snakes and drinking poison as a sign of their genuine faith, a sign of the strength of their faith. There was an article, maybe you saw this a week ago, in the Wall Street Journal by a woman who has written a book on this. And she spent a number of years interviewing people, studying it, studying them and what they do. It was not a critical article. and She doesn't hold to their views, but she was very fair to these people. And she, as I said, interviewed many who practiced this. And one of them, she quoted as saying, I promise the Lord I do everything in my power to keep the faith going. And what he meant by the faith is this practice of handling snakes and drinking strychnine. The man she quoted was named Randy, 
whom she called a doomed handler. He later died from snake bite. A lot of them do. Now, I think it's worth noting, none of these signs are given as a command or given as a test of faith. Even if this were written by Mark, to use them in that way violates Scripture. It violates Matthew chapter 4 and verse 7, where Jesus said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. These are unusual verses. William Hendrickson cautioned against preaching sermons and basing doctrine on them that are difficult. But some have done that and done it in, I would say, a, a clever way. For example, one British commentator, very good commentator, Harold St. John, I found him very helpful in my studies through the Gospel of Mark, interpreted the, the five signs spiritually, not literally. The first evidence of conversion is seen in the new tastes that we have, the new way of looking and act, uh, do, looking at things and doing things. The demons of envy and anger are expelled. We speak in new tongues when, when lying and gossip give way to words of grace. Power over snakes is really, the dominion, is really the dominion that we have over sin. And protection from poison is the safeguard we have as we move through the cesspool of this world. I like that. It, it, it's all true. But I think not the meaning of these verses, which remain controversial and uh, for many doubtful. In verses 19 through 20, the scene shifts a final time to Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives and to the Lord's ascension to heaven and His enthronement. I've, uh, I've already commented on these. There's no controversy here. The Lord physically ascended and is now ministering as our great high priest, ensuring that we will succeed in our mission on this earth. Verse 20 ends the chapter. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. There's nothing in the Gospels like that, that statement. Uh, these verses uh, sound more like, uh, this verse rather, sounds more like a summary of the book of Acts. Nevertheless, it's true, though it may not be genuine to Mark. B.B. Warfield, the Princeton theologian, wrote that these last 12 verses are a spurious invention of the scribes. If that's correct, and Mark intended to end his gospel on verse 8, as I think he did, why did he do that? It does seem to end abruptly. Does it have a melancholy ending, as Professor Metzger said? I don't think so. In fact, it ends much as it began. You remember how the Gospel of Mark opens? It's been some months since we looked at it, but it begins, the first verse, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then it moves to the ministry of John the Baptist. There's no genealogy, as in Matthew and Luke. There's no birth narrative, as in those Gospels. Mark begins with John and the Lord's baptism. Jesus is simply there, as one writer put it, and declared to be the Son of God by heavenly voice, by the Father. So... The, the sudden end of the Gospel of Mark is really consistent with the sudden beginning, or the abrupt end is consistent with the abrupt beginning of the Gospel. Still, the ending is surprising, and, and that may be the point. To cause us to focus on the empty tomb and the fear of the women. Both of those are powerful images. Powerful images. 
They're reminders of two essential truths. The might of God and the weakness of man. There is nothing more detrimental to the Christian life and the mission of the church than a low view of the sovereignty of God and a high view of the ability of man. That is natural religion. That is false religion. But here we see the opposite. The women saw the empty tomb and could not comprehend it. When the others heard the report of the resurrection, they were not believing it. And no one can in his or her own ability. It takes an interpreter to explain it. A divine interpreter to explain it. Ultimately, that interpreter, of course, is the Holy Spirit. It takes a work of God to open the heart so that we understand the truth of the gospel, the truth of these events, the reality of these events, and respond properly to them. He must produce faith in us and give us the energy and the courage to proclaim it to others. We're to do it. We're responsible to do it. But we cannot do it in our own strength. We will always fail. But in God's strength, we cannot fail. That was seen early in the Gospel in chapter 2 when Jesus did a miracle that proved He is the Son of God. He gave a lame man, He rather forgave a lame man, and proved that he could do that by telling the man to walk. The man picked up his bed, walked, and went home. That is us. Unforgiven and unable until the Son of God forgives us through faith and makes us walk. And we are all represented here in the women and the disciples who were unknowing, unbelieving and afraid. They needed grace. And we need grace. And that grace is signified and demonstrated in the empty tomb. It is the greatest symbol in all the world of strength. The, the greatest evidence in all of history of the Lord's power and faithfulness. It's the proof of what Mark said at the very beginning of this Gospel, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's the proof, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54, that death has been swallowed up in victory. What would our lives be like if every day we had in our minds a picture, had in our minds the thought of the empty tomb? It reminds us that the God who conquered death is the one who sends us out each day to proclaim the good news as the women were told to do, and He is with us at every step. It's a reminder, as the Calvinist and evangelist George Whitfield said, that we are immortal till our work is done. The God who swallowed up death and victory is the guarantee of that. He's with us at every moment. And it is true. We are immortal until our work is done. And so after they left the tomb, the women recovered from their confusion and fear, and they joyfully went to the disciples and told them the good news. The Lord can do, for, do, can do that for us as well. No, I think this is a reasonable ending to the second gospel. It leaves us with the image of the empty tomb, the greatest symbol in all of God's word and all of history of God's power and of our hope. Death has been swallowed up in victory. The king of terrors has been defeated. Hell itself has been defeated by the Savior. And He saved us from that terrible end. And that victory has been won for every believer in Jesus Christ. I titled this last lesson in Mark, 
How does it end? Referring to the ending of the gospel. Are the last 12 verses original or does the gospel intentionally end with verse 8? But that question also serves as the, the right way to end this study, this series in the gospel of Mark. How does this life end for us? And this final short chapter answers that with hope. That's how it ends for the believer. The empty tomb is our victory. But that again, as I said, is true only for the believer in Jesus Christ. He saw that faith, that belief in the paralytic in chapter 2. And seeing that faith, he said, your son, your sins are forgiven. So have you believed? If not, recognize you are in need of forgiveness. You are a sinner. You are under the judgment of God. You are under the wrath of God. That is the reality. But Christ receives the believer and forgives all who trust in Him. And they escape that end. So believe. Have faith. Have forgiveness and life everlasting. and Have the resurrection to come. That's our hope. May God help you to rest in that and rejoice in that and help all of us not to, to leave and be silent as those women were, not to be unbelieving in God's Word as those disciples were, but be obedient and be fruitful in the power of God. He can give us that, and He will as we walk by faith. Let's pray. Father, we do pray that you would make us bold, that you would strengthen our faith and give us obedience, that we would honor you and be a blessing to those around us, to be a blessing to the lost, to be lights in a dark and dismal world, a world that's under judgment, and yet we have the message of salvation, of escape, so, Lord, may we speak it and may we live it. And may we do it all to your glory. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.